Uh, welcome everyone who's tuned in. I'm Ross Pally, General Manager at Venture Lane. I assure you, I am not actually at Venture Lane right now. We are respecting the, the closure on non-essential businesses, and this is a virtual background. I'm really excited right now to have David Gersoff Richard and Paula Long on our, our Zoom panel today. Um, for a little bit of context, uh, a few weeks ago, we wiped the slate clean on all of our upcoming programming for Venture Lane and decided to make everything 100% geared towards helping uh, early stage tech companies navigate the current climate. Uh, we did an outreach to our entire mentor community, um, asking if anyone had expertise along those lines that they wanted to sort of step forward and share. And of course, David and Paula both came forward immediately after saying, we're in. Um, we've got some. We've got some experience and some some insights for everybody. So, really grateful that um, that the both of you have come forward and and are helping us sort of get all the knowledge out there that we need to founders who might be um, this might be their first downturn. So they don't quite have uh, the wartime founder experience yet, but they're certainly getting it right now. So after speaking with Paula and David, um, the topic that we settled on today. Uh, COVID-19 needs a different playbook than dot-com and the Great Recession. Um, so we have two founders here who have uh, quite successfully managed through prior downturns. Um, and there, there's a good amount of content out there um, of, of some more experienced founders sharing their past experiences. But I think the, the unique twist here and what might, what might end up being of most value is um, downturns have happened before. There are similarities, but of course, there are probably some uh, some new developments in in this downturn that make it a bit unique and warrant kind of like a reworking of the playbook. So, really quick, rules of the road. Uh, we'll turn it over to Paula and David in just a moment. Um, if anyone on the call has questions at any point, if you hover on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q and A button. Uh, if you have questions at any point or need clarification on anything, just click the Q&A button, uh, type in the questions that you have, and I will very politely interject um, our panelists today uh, with those questions that you raise. Um, so that's everything from my side, and now we will turn it over, over to Paula and David. Hey, so I'll introduce myself and then David will as well. Paula Long, I've been in six startups, founder of two. Um, I was in the dot-com phase just before the, the bust, uh, but we didn't realize it was busting. I was in a seed company um, during the, the 2001 um, challenges, and then I was a, a founder in a company that started just before 9-11. So I've got a fair amount of experience in dealing with startups. I call them times of peace and times of war. Um, you guys have just entered the time of war. And so it's kind of trying to figure out how you manage your way through that. Um, and so I can give you some tips of what I did. Um, some of it worked, some of it not so much. So I always say make new mistakes. David? Hi everyone, uh, David Gerzoff Richard here. Uh, also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, my first company was uh, started in uh, in the late 90s, was a voice over data company before even you could do voice over IP. Um, we exited that company right before things like Skype and Vonage basically uh, rewrote all the rules for uh, voice over anything. And uh, I had really fallen in love with the art of storytelling around innovation disruption. And I started uh, my current agency, Big Fish, um, back then. So we've been operating for uh, just over 20 years now and like Paula weathered a number of storms um, including the, the dot-com uh, bubble and bust, real estate bubble and bust and uh, a couple other you know bumps in the road in between and you know certainly uh, to echo what I've been hearing from Paula and Ross is that there are um, there are some similarities but there's some big big differences that uh, that we're seeing here. So, um, so, so that's that. My, uh, my business, um, we are a small agency boutique. We're uh, 16 employees and uh, here in Boston, but we uh, service clients all, uh, all around the world. And uh, certainly um, through all of those 
you know, twists and turns. Uh, we were working uh, alongside as partners with the startup companies. And um, I've seen um, some really, you know, great, um, call them pivots, call them adjustments, call them what have you, with the companies that we've partnered with along the way um, to, to get through. And I've also seen some, you know, some tragedies where um, the, the runway or the bridge or whatever euphemism we want to use for getting more capital to keep things running uh, simply ran out. And um, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm here today to kind of, you know, give some advice on how not to let that happen to, to your, to your company, to your startup. So want to get started? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. So we brought first, we just take you through sort of a timeline. Um, the dates are, are everybody disagrees. Oh, we've got Google doc, Google slides, munch a little bit of the formatting, but um, don't hold the date so tight as they basically kind of sort of the themes and what happened. Um, let me see if I make this bigger, if it does the right thing. Nope. Oh, well. Um, so basically, as you guys know, the dot-com bubble really started like in the mid nineties and went to sometime in 2000. And uh, what basically happened is highly invested, growth over profitability, great ROI, frothy, you know, we had 14 Super Bowl ads, I think in 99 or 2000. So lots of money on marketing. Um, then right around 2000, the bubble starts to leak, but it's not broken yet. And so some people see it happening and some people don't see it happening. Um, so, uh, so you start to see some, some, some kind of weird stuff going on. And then right around um, 2001 to 2002, it pretty much, it was gone. Most of the companies who hadn't, um, who had, you know, spent most of their money on marketing or whatever, or no longer existed. You saw, you know, your TAM is your total addressable market. And it's really scary when your TAM goes to zero, or it's really scary when, you know, all the customers you started to service um, started going out of business. Cause there got to be sort of a, a flywheel effect where, you know, the infrastructure guys were supporting the dot-com websites for e-commerce and the development guys were supporting those folks as well. And as they started to go have trouble, you start to see companies lose their, their markets and they lost their customers. And then 9-11 hit and you had some sort of some uncertainty. Um, so where were you around this time, David? Um, so I had, um, I had just got into, I, I, we'd exited, um, Signal in uh, in '99, and I had just started working on uh, working on Big Fish. So I was actually, of all places, in a basement, not so dissimilar from where I am right now. Um, I found some really, really inexpensive um, office space in um, in Brookline. Um, I had a number of clients that we were starting to to really pick up some momentum with, and it was like, um, you know, some of them were dot coms, um, some of them were telcos. You know, they, you know, the dot com was sort of the center of that that hit, and then um, it kind of bridged out to a lot of the the tech space um, who were servicing them. Uh, you know, whether it was through, you know, data storage or you know, you know connect connectivity, what have you. Um, and it it got it got bad. Um, fortunately, we were already in startup mode because we were a startup at that time, and. Um, for us, um, as a as an agency, as a small company, uh, we were able to make um, you know adjustments that w would ensure our survival through you know long term through um, through that situation. Um, and so you know that's kind of uh, from my own personal experience the closest that I've come to to dealing with this as a like as a startup founder at that startup stage. Um, the things I would say there is, you know, are, um, you know, and I think this holds true uh, even for where we are right now is, you know, when I, when I think of like that, there's a sort of that, um, the recycling saying, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, at the time it, for me, it was um, reduce, reuse and renegotiate. And uh, literally um, I was working with um, the vendors that were coming to to me, whether it was you know for rent or for phone or for whatever our expenses were, 
And I was just saying like, look, um, we got to bend, not break on this. What can we do to, to, to make this work? And then on the flip side, with all of our customers, I was having that same conversation. Like, look, you know, they were coming saying, look, you know, I'm really sorry. We, you know, we like working with you, but we just don't have the budget. And I would say, well, I get that. What can we do to like, just, you know, keep the lights on and keep the engine, you know, running where there's a little bit of gas in the tank. Um, and uh, it was, it was those slight adjustments that um, at that time that got us through to, to the, the, the sort of the, the flip side of, of that. Yeah, so for, for me, um, in like 99, 98, I was in a startup called uh, Bright Tiger. And right around 99, we started realizing there were two problems. The product didn't work, which isn't great, or it didn't scale. Um, and also, you start to see start, starting to dry out for funding. So we had built a 100-day plan um, to see how we were going to sell the company. So we had looked at where we were capitalized. We looked at where we were in the market. And we fortunately sold the company um, in late 99 um, to Allaire. So from there, I went to Allaire um, as part of the transition. And I, I worked there for a while. And mid, in mid-2000, I got approached by a friend to go to a internet infrastructure startup. Um, that's right, in 2000, I went there. That's why I said the bubble leaked. We didn't, you know, we saw the stock market going weird, but everybody thought they were different. Um, everybody thought that this was just a short blip and that things would be good. So I joined a seed funded startup called Ironstream. Um, we had good seed money. We had like money. We were in 2000. We had money to the end of 2001. But what we saw was by late 2000, um, most of our TAM had been caught like in half or in our third. Um, most of our comps from you know, who you're going to raise money with um, were either going out of business or had their stock reduced by like 90%. Um, and so when we looked at that, we said, well, wait a minute, is this thing even going to go? Um, we had just got into the development phase and we were just starting to think about who our customers were going to be. And to be honest with you in that one, um, given everything that was going on, uh, we decided to actually close that company. Um, so we gave money back to the investors. They said it was the best investment they made in 2000, which is kind of sad. Um, but what we looked at was we said, okay, so our market's gone. Our customer's not going to be back before we run out of money. Um, and we think it's going to be hard to get money for infrastructure, hardware, and software. So we actually, um, we actually closed that company. Um, I wasn't a founder in that one, but what came out of that? So sometimes out of bad stuff, good stuff comes. So myself and two of the other people at Ironstream started a company called Equalogic. Uh, we got funded in July of 2001, which is lucky. I'm not sure we would have gotten funded after um, June, uh, after September 11th. But because of the things that had happened at Ironstream, we were smarter. So we were already very conservative about hiring. We were very conservative about spend. But, you know, we still had to make a date. So we thought getting the product to market was more important than just conserving cash. And then 9-11 happened. And with 9-11, you know, that people intermixed the 9-11 tragedy with the dot-com bust. And they were, they were different. They overlapped, but they were different. What happened with 9-11 is everything, uncertainty, you know, revenue pause, VCs got nervous. And so at that point, what we actually did was we went back and did a replan. And so we, we decided that it was more important that we released when we thought our customers were gonna be available than we tried to go as fast as we could. So we, we sort of slowed down the hiring. We didn't bring on sales or marketing. So for the seat guys, you know, the founders were doing the, you know, going to talk to customers or beta customers or potential um, product management work. So what we did was we really skinnied down and we, um, we sort of delayed sort of the roadmap. We shifted it left. Um, we knew usually trying to go as fast as you can. Um, and so we rode that one out. Um, I will tell you that, you know, when we went to raise our, our B round, um, the market was still sort of a, a disaster and we got a pretty big haircut when we went to do our B. Um, so uh, the good news is by the time we exited, we actually exited with a really good, um, 
an ROI. And so we actually exited at the beginning of 2008. So I got to miss that, um, that joy. Um, Cause we were already, we'd been merged into Dow in, um, in, in January, 2008. So the takeaways here were really about for us was continuing to look about whether or not the customer still existed, you know, kind of what your runway was when you actually came into market, was there a market? And so those are the kinds of things we thought about when we, when we started to move forward. Um, so David actually got to live through the, the financial crisis. And, um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go back to, um, to, to the bubble bursting and, uh, and 9-11. It was really, you know, for me, it was like a one-two punch. I felt like we were just starting to crawl out of the, the, the bubble burst when like this, the, the, the planes hit in, in 9-11. And you know, as I was kind of thinking through this this discussion, this talk, um, 9-11 in, in some ways um, is closest to what we're dealing with right now in the sense that, you know, the bubble burst really only affected anybody that was in one of those newfangled dot-com type things, right? 9-11 um, effect, affected the whole country. And, uh, you know, people were glued to their televisions um, trying to understand and make sense out of the tragedy uh, that the, the country experienced. And um, where I say it's kind of closest to, to COVID and, and the situation we're in right now is that, you know, me as a, uh, as a marketer, as a brand um, storyteller, what we saw for, you know, six months following 9-11 was nobody thought it was a good idea to do any kind of marketing or advertising or anything um, because it just felt like it was tone deaf. On top of that, the news agencies, the media, the reporters um, who were right before 9-11 um, were sort of the cheerleaders trying to get, um, trying to tell the stories and share stories about how companies were making it through the, uh, the bubble burst, um, suddenly said, like, don't talk to me unless you have something dealing with 9-11, recovery, relief, what, what have you. Um, now some big, big differences there. So, so at the time, you know, none of the clients I had had anything to do with emergency services, first responders, um, recovery, anything like that. So the advice that we gave to our clients was like, look, pay us half, like cut us in half right now um, cause things are going to get really quiet, really fast. And like, there's not much that we can do. We'll help you navigate this, but for, for the time being, and for the time being, like you need to preserve your capital as do we, um, we don't know if we're going to be going back into this bubble burst hole. Um, my clients really appreciated that. And we actually didn't lose a single one through, you know, through that, that time period, um, uh, which was, which was great differences um, between 9-11 and COVID that I'm seeing today uh, are, are um, well, one is that we didn't have social media. Back in 9-11, we had, I don't know, AOL Instant Messenger. Um, there was, you know, the precursors to what we see as social media today, but it, it was not, you know, people were not spending the screen time that they do um, today, you know, four weeks ago, you know, three years ago that they, you know, back then. And so the, there, are, um, there, there are ways to do storytelling today. Um, and we can get into this and in sort of like what to do now later um, that didn't exist in 9-11. And I'm much, much more optimistic and hopeful about brands and brand storytelling today than I was in during 9/11. Um, so with that, um, that gets us to to 2008. Um, 2008, as Paula was saying, um, she did not experience. Um, that was one where uh, a number of the clients that we had that were in the financial services space and in um, uh, obviously in real estate. Um, took it really hard. Um, that was the first real crisis that we had where we did have social media. And um, there were some some big sort of mistakes that brands were making. Um, I remember, I want to think 
it was uh, it was either like a hashtag like Ask Chuck or Ask JP Morgan. Um, they were running on Twitter where you could ask questions about like your retirement fund. And um, this is, if you recall, this is when we had the 99 and the one percenters, they were kind of breaking up and people were getting onto Twitter and asking um, the questions they were asking were not what to do with their retirement fund, but like, when do I get my house back? Um, so these were, um, these, these were some, some challenging, challenging times for us to navigate. We certainly lost some business and um, we, we had to do a lot of handholding with our clients on how to make um, their, their brand messaging and their corporate communications not seem tone deaf to um, a, a portion of the population that we're having a, a very rough time. Uh, I think what we're seeing now as real, as, as different than um, 2008 is that we're all in it together. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing right now um, greater unemployment in Massachusetts uh, in the last, you know, four weeks than we did in the entire sort of great recession that followed um, 2008. So um, there's not one segment that's not feeling it right now. And that really does, um, you know, create uh, opportunities for um, to tell appropriate storytelling, but also, um, you know, have the entire nation and the world um, be able to um, level with a brand and understand where they are. And we can get to that um, a little bit more. I'll turn it back to you, Paula. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to disagree, disagree with you a bit, both with uh, the quote, Great Recession and the um, bubble slash 9-11 there was bleed over. So what you had was you had a bunch of on paper internet millionaires who were buying houses, who were, you know, flying everywhere, who were, you know, um, uh, actually helping to seed the market. Um, that kind of tapped out. And so what you saw was you saw um, it affected the home market. It affected, you know, kind of what people were doing day to day. It sort of fed on itself. Like for example, you know, companies, even big companies like Cisco were finding that, you know, part of their market went away or even Microsoft, part of their market went away because a lot of us were using those tools. So it had a, a rippling effect, but it was a ripple. It wasn't like a, a big, like, you know, uh, bomb fell in the, in the economy. And in the financial crisis, I was consulting with people and what, what that one was really about was the uncertainty of, you know, the VCs, because they were not able to raise big funds at the time. And so they were picking winners and losers a little bit. If anybody's a VC on the phone, you don't have to admit that. Um, but things were, things were, um, you know, it was, it was, it was odd because there was a lot of companies who um, weren't really impacted from a, you know, their products were still useful and their products were still important, but they were not, you know, must have, must have. Lots of people have must have products, but there's few products where if your company doesn't buy it, they'll fail. And so people were just stalling and you start to see that problem. Um, but in both cases and in, in two, and in even with today's, a few things I think are true. One is um, you don't know how long it's going to last. So uncertainty causes people to do all kinds of interesting things. Um, in the first two, the the bubble and the financial crisis, it lasted longer than people expected it to. Um, and things looked different when it came out. My guess is what's gonna happen, and we'll go into this in a, in a few slides, is um, we're gonna see the same thing here. Because even when things started to get back to normal, it was took a long time for the, the flywheel to keep going again. So, um, so it, it'll kind of be interesting to see if that happens again. Um, so let's go to the, let's go to sort of the, sort of the, some of the root things that are likely um, uh, things you want to think about as you as you go forward. So, yeah, Paul, I would I would just add in there. So for for 2008, there were there were definitely um, segments that that took it much much worse than than everybody. Uh, I remember, yeah, I was as an agency um, in right after we we climbed out of um, the bubble burst in 9/11 there was a, this, the, the clean tech movement started. And we were one of the first agencies to be doing a lot of, um, you know, eco-friendly and clean energy and clean tech. We were doing stuff in solar and, and wind and everything else. And there was not a single VC that was investing in this stuff in uh, 2000, 2001. In 2008, every VC had a, uh, 
um, at a, a, a clean tech um, group. And it was like, it, it's just all just came to a sudden stop. Um, so, you know, I, I agree that it, you know, like it, it did, you know, ripple through, but there were definitely some, like some big, big, big losers there. Um, totally agree. All right. So, so let's, let's, let's please continue. Yeah. There was just a ripple effect and some people got hit much harder than others. Um, but even as you start to look through how you're going to, how you're going to make it through this one, um, you know, you're going to have to plot a pass path forward. And it's really, really hard to do an honest replan because entrepreneurs, myself included, we're optimistic, right? And so you really need to, you know, spend, this should have been true all along, but it, it sort of, you know, you get into this milestone growth play against, you know, conserving cash and profitability. Um, you need to spend every dollar like it's your last because you don't really know at the end of the dot com, when dot com was going to end, when the financial crisis things were going to pick up and money was going to be more um, available. Um, and I think the same thing is true now. Um, so you'll get funded um, if you survive and you have a good market, you can show you can grow um, uh, if you survive. If you're trying to grow, they're going to give you a pass on growth a little bit during this if you can show that there's a market and there will be growth. So I'd be very careful about um, how I invested and what I was, in, you know, because you got to survive to be able to, to raise more money. Um, and so when you start to run your financial models, do it as a worst case. Um, and then, you know, look at ways you can extend your runway. So back in 2001 or 2008, um, you know, your biggest expense was probably headcount. And it was followed by maybe infrastructure or equipment. Now one of your big expenses probably is cloud services. So there's a place where you need to go look and see, can I optimize that? Um, because you probably have a bunch of tech debt you haven't fixed. Um, because a lot of times what you're gonna see is people say, I'm not gonna worry about margins right now. I just wanna worry about getting customers and I'll fix margin later. Um, now might be a good time to go back and look at, um, you know, cleaning up that tech debt, getting your AWS or your Google or your Azure, your bills down, um, because you're not gonna, at this point, unless you have a major new feature that's gonna, no one's gonna notice it anyway, um, it's probably the ideal time to actually start to do some optimizations, because I don't really think a major new feature in most cases is gonna make a difference for how you survive, at least in the short term. Um, cutting your, uh, AWS bill in half um, or taking like a third off of it could actually give you a, a much longer runway. Um, and then the next thing you kind of want to look at is, you know, does your customer exist anymore? Right? So when this happens, you know, if you're a travel agency or you're, a, you know, a, an e catering service or a point of sale company, does your customer currently exist and can they pay you? Um, back in, in the dot-com and the great recession, your customers sort of still existed and some people could pay you. Nowadays, there's, there's industries that are just frozen, if you will, stalled. Would you agree, David? Yeah, so just you know, going through this slide, I, I think that you know, I completely agree with you that the first point is, um, I just, and you know, because I've been through a couple of these already, it's just kind of like ingrained into my DNA that, you know, when it comes to growth, I'm, I'm hoping for the best, but on the flip side, I'm prepared for the worst. So I would just almost title that as hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. Um, you know, the, the one twist I would say on does your um, target customer still exist um, is that maybe they exist, um, but they don't exist um, in, a, in a position that they can make an investment right now. Uh, because they're probably going through these same exact, you know, um, conversations and processes that we're talking about, looking where they can, you know, reduce what they can reuse in other places, um, all this sort of thing. But, you know, in, in maybe they go out of business or maybe they don't, but they're certainly not, might not be in a position to sign a huge contract. Um, that being said, you know, they are looking for alternatives and all sorts of 
ways to, um, you know, as, as Paula puts it, you know, go through and uh, review and revise all their, all their, their, you know, their tech platforms and what they're spending money on. And that creates opportunities in my opinion for, um, for early stage startups and even like some, some middle and later stage startups to come in and say, listen, like, we understand that like nobody's signing new contracts or business, or maybe they're not um, signing a uh, very little um, new business is being signed right now. But you know, we want to be a partner with you on the, uh, the flip side of this. What can we do to help? Like, is there like some, you know, some bit of our, you know, our platform, our service that we can open up to you that you can use for free or at a very reduced price right now um, to kind of like set the hook and get them using it so that, when they come out of this on the on the back end, they're thinking, "Oh, like I remember, you know, startup A, and startup A was, you know, you know, was very proactive. They were graceful. They helped us through that tough time. You know, let's see what we can do to work with them and increase that engagement." So, um, yeah, I think that the customer may or may not exist, um, but I don't know that it's like it's it's necessarily binary. Um, it may be that they're just hunkered down and they're looking for, they're grasping for help right now, just like the rest of us. Um, and, you know, certainly their behaviors have changed and I'm happy to talk about, you know, how to reach them um, right now and, and prepare to reach them later on, uh, later on in this discussion. I don't disagree. I also think there's a, so in the dot com um bust and in the great recession you really weren't gonna take like you know mothergoose.com was actually a company in the um in the in the in the bubble and so was like smarterkids.com there was a bunch of sites who weren't going to be able to pivot and be something else or weren't going to be able to message they were something else now you're looking at there's opportunities so for example if you can say and i think david this is kind of what you're saying if you can even just change your messaging or change your product to say you know you're going to help remote workers right? You're going to help with better communication. You're going to help with your e-learning platform. You're going to help parents with their kids um, as opposed to, you know, um, targeting in somewhere else. Maybe it was business learning and maybe you're going to move it to kid learning or children learning. So there are places now where, you know, things are going to grow. Um, and so you can, if you can do it with messaging, it'd be a beautiful thing. And maybe David can tell you how to do that. But you can probably make some slants. I've seen a bunch of custom companies today who never, you know, marketed themselves or pitched themselves as, you know, remote um, employee um, efficiency products or communication products or learning products. But they're they because of the way they were built, they can they can they can squint and tilt the story and and start to to grow in that domain. Have you seen that a lot, David? Or? Yeah, I, I've seen I've seen all sorts of um, really interesting adjustments. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, from a marketing, branding, advertising standpoint, um, there's no, there's no live sports right now. Um, any of the, the ad agencies, any of the, um, the, the, the branding campaigns that have gone on, um, they all have to, to, to change, um, basically everything where they're reaching people. Um, the, even the visuals where it's, um, you know, people shaking hands like that, indicating a business deal is done like that doesn't fly right now and probably won't fly for a very long time on the, the, the back end of this. Um, you know, the, the opportunity I see for, for, for startups here is, um, is thinking through and, you know, coming up with creative ways to be able to, um, to connect with customers um, outside of the way that sort of business has been done before um, some great examples that I've seen, um, there's, um, and these are sort of outliers in terms of like they've become superstars, um, but there's a cowboy museum out in the Midwest and uh, they closed down um, because they can't have people in there and they literally threw the keys to the social media to the security guard and he's never tweeted before, he's never done anything and he's great because like he, he's, he's typing a hashtag and then the word hashtag and then whatever and it's like it's super endearing people love it and like they're you know they're they're actually getting more traction online than they had before this thing happened um another great example is uh is steakums like i didn't even know steakums was a brand up until 
um, two or three days ago. And the social media platform for Stakeums um, has actually been like speaking as you would want um, a government official to really be speaking. Um, and it's gotten noticed and shared and reshared. And I'm, I'm sure there's people who are, are tuning in now that have seen this already. Um, but go check out Stakeums on Twitter. I, I never thought that I'd be promoting um, to follow frozen meat on Twitter, but like it's a thing now. Um, and like the, the, the sort of the underlying point here is that they figured out how to, um, to get around the roadblocks that have suddenly been put up in, in brand communication and, and marketing communication, which is um, the, the media doesn't want to hear from you unless you're doing something to support the COVID effort in some way, shape or form. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, because we have social media and everybody has their own platforms now, you know, self-publishing is becoming, uh, it was already pretty big. And now it, it's like the only channel that you really have. I mean, you can do this from your basement. You can, you, you're, you can own, um, your conversation and your own media channels that way. So, um, thinking through how to tap into this is, is good. And look, on the sort of the spectrum of winners and losers, but there's, there's companies like local companies I work with is form labs, 3d printing company, uh, 3d printing has been around for a while. Um, but these guys figured out that they could print 3d print 300 swabs an hour where you don't need cotton. You don't need anything. You could print them literally in the lab at the hospital and you've got 300 tests coming out every hour. Um, that's a huge, huge help there. We're helping them get a lot of media traction that on the flip side, there's brands like, I don't know, like IOT automated pet feeders. Like nobody needs a, a automated pet feeder right now because they're all at home. Like the cat is coming and like telling, telling you, hey, feed me. They're not talking to the, the robot in the kitchen. Um, and so like it's those kind of companies that need to figure out on how to do storytelling and tap into being like, you know, there are segments where it's like, look, for maybe emergency responders, um, or first responders or emergency room workers or people like that where, you know, that they can't be home to feed a, a, a pet. That suddenly, like, there's an opportunity to be um, donating these things and, like, helping them out there. So it's really thinking about um, your customer, your product, what your customer is going through right now, and, like, the, the questions the, that they're, they're asking, the, the, the anxieties that they're feeling, the, you know, the challenges they're facing and figuring out how you can like help them solve the pro the new problems they've they have um, and how to reach them and communicate them to, to them in some you know clever maybe funny interesting way that's not tone deaf and like it it seems really tricky but um, there's no silver bullet here this is the kind of thing you kind of need to think through for your own product your own customer and the situation they find themselves in and it's, it's kind of like that sniper one shot, one kill where you just need to line everything up. And if you get that, you know, the, the right solution to the right problem and you can reach them where they are, then you got something that you can work with. Totally. I think you can also want to say, oh, you want to jump in, Ross? I'm just going to quickly interject. Um, we're going until 1245. So quick time check, another five minutes or so. Okay. So just to, um, let's, we'll speed it up a little bit. So just keep in mind that things always take longer than you think they're going to take. Um, and then even when they quote come out of it, it's going to come out of it in phases. So it may be take a while for people to go to restaurants again or for people to travel. So you're, and so you're going to watch that things will start to pick up, but it'll pick up sort of, you know, probably in stages or in silos. So don't, don't think that, you know, in one quarter, this is all over and we go back to the new norm because it's probably, I mean, you can think that, but I'm betting it's not true. And then just a quick one for, uh, for David. Um, uh, I think everybody now, because we're bored or going stir crazy are opening emails that we never would have opened before. So you might actually want to go back and try some, some online um, email campaigns or putting out blogs or, because most of the people, I'd love to see the statistics, but I bet if somebody goes and looks, they'll see um, people are actually starting to read, especially stuff that talks about remote, remote working or talks about how to optimize something or to save money or what other people are doing. So I'm just going to pop to the next 
a great point. So I'm just going to jump in there real quick and pull in a couple threads there. So Paula mentioned uh, restaurants. Yeah, I see what we're dealing with now is almost like that iridium line with dinosaurs where, you know, if you know your natural history, like below this line, you find dinosaur bones above it, you, you don't, that there are, you know, people are going to emerge, you know, business is going to go back, it, it might not be business as usual. Right now, everybody is under sort of, you know, lock and key in their house, um, preparing meals for themselves day in and day out. Um, just think in terms of like consumer behavior and consumer change. When you emerge, you know, a month, two months from, from this and you go out, there are going to be restaurants that are winners and there's going to be restaurants that are losers. The mediocre restaurant that's serving spaghetti and meatballs, people are not going to go in and spend money on spaghetti and meatballs because that's what they've been eating and cooking for the last two, two months. And they've gotten pretty good at cooking spaghetti and meatballs and they're not going to pay $20 for spaghetti and meatballs. I don't know. We'll have to see if that happens. But I think I'm going to – let's talk a little bit about the new twists. Sure. So with um, – with uh, you know any of the past um, uh, challenges, you know your supply chain wasn't ever really disrupted. With 9/11, flights stopped for a little while, but then the supply chain came back. Now, if you are not an essential business, you know if you're trying to do physical goods, especially as a small company, it gets tricky because the supply chains are starting to get tight and getting cut off. Um, the other one is not every company can work remotely or virtually. And so can your company be a virtual company? We didn't have that problem um, in, the other, in the past because, you know, you could still go into the office if the company existed, right? Now the company can exist, but can it exist in a virtual environment? Um, and then if your company's uh, not, I don't know if this is good or bad. Um, if your company is considered an essential business, uh, this can have positives and negatives. It can definitely help you to grow but it can also be sort of a challenge if the other pieces um, of the puzzle, like you can't really run virtually or you can't get the product of the supply chain can be a problem. So these are some of the new twists that you wouldn't have faced um, in the past and things you sort of have to think through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have like one minute. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as sort of a wrap, this is going to affect every part of your business every part of your business, your team, you're going to have to be communicating with them, your investors, um, you know, they're not going to call the shots, but you should really listen. They've been through these before. Um, and so they'll be, they'll all probably be telling you to cut, cut, cut and, um, and uh, conserve, 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 which probably is not a bad thing, but you have to see what that means to you. Um, and the other thing is, again, look at your roadmap, figure out what you absolutely have to do versus, what you, and it's going to get you um, customers or revenue or something or better position you in the future and you're screwed if you don't stall it. And if you can, try, try to do things that, you know, take out tech debt, um, improve customer sat, and uh, reduce cost. Uh, Anything else you want to throw in there, David? Because we're like right at the time. I didn't know if we had any questions. Yeah, well, I just, I, I'll, I'll just finish with uh, I, one. I agree with you about email marketing. Also, LinkedIn is going to be huge right now. Everybody's on LinkedIn. It's an app on their phone. And there's, it's like a desert right now in terms of content because nobody really is, knows what to do with it. So when you do put stuff on there, you're going to see, at least this is what I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing. I think you're going to see a lot more um, interactivity there. Um, in terms of you know what you talked about, um, uh, can your company go virtual? Um, I think I'll tie this into like also thinking about how um, how you can think differently about sort of the the back end of this, where you know it may be that your strategy was to sell in from the top down to get to like a CXO to get them to buy. Let's say it's a SaaS product or whatnot. Um, the other day, I did something I never thought I was going to do, which was I was handing out like $6,000 computers out my front door to each one of my employees because they cannot function um, running our business off of laptops. It's just not possible. So, you know, all of a sudden I've got these, you know, I've got 16, $6,000 machines going out the front door that were behind a mesh network, behind a firewall. Like, you know, employees couldn't download malware. They couldn't install something without permission. Now they're all um, on a home Comcast network where the modem probably has the username and password of admin and admin, and they can download anything they want onto those computers. 
So you know, is there an opportunity if you're a SaaS company to give out like a free freeware or a freemium uh, type of a play where you get people downloading um, software and getting it on their systems now while it's not behind a firewall and then you know, have it go back to the company where the software is there and you've now kind of Trojan horsed your way in to a company from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down. So it's, it's just thinking a little bit and being like, okay, like what are the behaviors here that people are doing and how do we take advantage of that on the back end of this? Love it. Love it. That's a, it's a very interesting insight. I like that one. Um, Paula and David, thank you so much. Uh, go, going back to the original topic, I, I think the value here was, I, I'm just looking at kind of like the list of folks who tuned in for today. A lot of people who, based on, based on how old they are, this is, this is their first go at managing a team through a downturn or being a part of an early stage team for the first time as opposed to a thousand person company during a downturn. So if you're in that situation, where do you turn to get the guidance? You turn to people who have who've managed through downturns like this before. And it's a lot of the, a lot of good, but kind of like uh, consistently the same sort of guidance around uh, managing cash flow and retaining customers. Um, so I think here it was useful to get the nuances from you both around in 2000 social media, not so existent today. It is, it means there's a lot more opportunity to think of some uh, good uh, narratives that resonate um, and give yourself an opportunity to think of how to be on the offensive a bit and still maintain some level of growth in adoption and product usage, even if it is in revenue right now. So those nuances I think were key, especially for the folks who are able to join today. Um, Ross, I want to actually say, you, know, you brought up a good point. I want to jump in and just want to say something real quick to all the startup leaders that are, that are, that are there. Um, realize this, you know, you, you've got multiple audiences and one of them is your own team. And your own team is spread out everywhere. They're, they're in basements, they're in attics, they're in their, their bedrooms. You know, it's not an ideal situation for them. And yeah, you've got Slack. Yeah, you've got a couple, maybe Asana, a couple other ways to be able to do project management and work with each other. Um, but that's really sort of like the day-to-day -day tactical issues that are getting you through um, running the, the business. What they don't have is um, regular access to leadership and hearing what's on your mind as the CEO, as the founder. And it's really difficult to do this, but you, you know, I would recommend doing like an open office hours on um, you know, either on like Hangouts or on, uh, on Zoom. Oh my God, I got something coming up. Um, anyway, um, you know, be as transparent as you can about the state of the business and like what you need from your team and, um, and, and try to communicate with them um, as best as possible. And what I'm finding is doing an office hours or just doing like an all hands um, weekly meeting where I get everybody together and I just literally tell them the state of the business, what's happening, where, and I'm getting such great feedback from my team um, thanking me for letting them, letting me, letting them know where they are. Cause basically that what's on all of their minds is, you know, do I have a job? Like there's a lot of people getting laid off. What's the status of the company? Is there gas in the tank? You know what, like that's what they're worried about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very important. Rap, I just left a slide up there that said all the things I made, I did wrong last time. So <laughs> if you're on the call, you can screenshot this slide or um, we'll, we'll circulate the desk as, uh, the deck as well. I'm just going to take over the screen for one quick moment um, before everyone signs off. Just letting you know a few quick um, webinars that we have up and coming next week through Venture Lane. Um, on Tuesday, we'll have the Pitch VCs uh, want to hear in a crisis. So we'll have uh, Matt Toms from Bolt, uh, who not, they not only do hardware now, they are also uh, fully software and tech in terms of their investment thesis, and Dan Heck from OpenView. So they'll be talking about how to, if you are uh, making an investor pitch in this time or the near future, how to incorporate the narrative of the current climate and your company's planning and response around that. Um, on Thursday, we will have mindfulness exercises for stress reduction. So Jen Earl's fantastic sort of holistic life and career coach walking us through some, not strictly meditation, these are more kind of like introspective, reflective exercises for identifying your sources of stress and, and processing those things and working through them. And then lastly, we have our, the next installment of our Fighting Bulls series. 
So this is Christian Mogel, founder of Venture Lane, and Brian Denenberg, uh, managing partner at Agile Sales Method, interviewing Anthony Venus, uh, co-founder and CEO at YayPay. Um, and part of the main through line of this series is interviewing uh, CEOs right now who are finding opportunity and silver lining in the crisis and having some, some, some great success managing their team through the current downturn. Uh, you can take a screenshot of this slide or as always, you can go to theventurelane.com program and events um, to see all these things and follow us on LinkedIn and of course, subscribe to the newsletter. So I will stop sharing. And with that, um, Paula and David, thank you again. Thank you for your time uh, putting this content together. Masterfully uh, balanced between uh, the both of you for these last 45 minutes. Um, so thank you again. And for everyone tuned in, uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank you.